was 25, my good friend Lish struck up a relationship with a woman living in London. Now that I'm in my 30s, the idea of even traveling so far as Arlington for sex strikes me as outrageous. <laughs> But in my 20s, I was wildly envious of Lish's intercontinental love affair. The whole thing seemed impossibly romantic. So when Lish told me that her British girlfriend was coming to visit and was bringing along someone named Emily, a single friend from her British rugby team, naturally I insisted on meeting this woman. I too wanted in on the jet-setting power lesbian couple lifestyle. So Lish set up a double date where we'd all go skiing together for the day. I figured I'd charm this woman with my prowess on the slopes and we'd be canoodling by the fireside in no time. <laughs> Regrettably, none of this came to pass. <laughs> I spent hours riding ski lifts with Emily and I managed to get very little out of her other than irritated grunts. Making conversation with this woman was like pulling bad British teeth. <laughs> the whole thing left me feeling pretty uncomfortable a feeling that only worsened as I skied over a large patch of ice, took a massive fall, and had to get carted off the mountain by the ski patrol. <laughs> I figured this marked the end of things for me and Emily. But a few weeks later, I received a Facebook friend request from Emily, along with a message that said, Hey, Tori, why don't we go on a vacation together? How about Greece or Spain? It's hard to say what might compel a person to suggest international travel to someone who isn't even yet their Facebook friend. <laughs> and sure, I could have chosen to be skeptical of the invitation, but instead, I took the message as a clear indication that Emily was madly in love with me. I hadn't previously found her to be especially attractive or interesting. Like, we had struggled to maintain conversation for the duration of a ski lift ride. But here she was, proposing an intercontinental love affair, and I was into it. <laughs> With some amount of disbelief that any of this was actually happening, I wrote back to Emily and told her that Greece sounded marvelous, and the two of us started planning out our second date. <laughs> now, for anyone out there who's raising an eyebrow and is like, well, I mean, does a trip to the Mediterranean really qualify as a date? Let me remind you that lots of lesbians move in together on their second date. So really, we were taking things slow. Emily set forth to planning an ambitious itinerary of island hopping, and I set forth to imagining our future together, thinking about romantic nights out on the West End and raising beautiful children with puckish British accents. As for warning everybody, I will be adopting a British accent later in this story, and it's gonna be anything but puckish, so just brace yourselves. A few weeks later, I anxiously boarded a plane to Athens, and I arrived with instructions to meet Emily at a hotel by the pier, where we'd be taking an afternoon ferry out to Santorini. When I caught sight of Emily, I smiled broadly and attempted to adopt a casual sexiness. In return, Emily scowled at me and said, we'll have to eat a quick lunch here. The food's crap, but at least that waitress is hot. <laughs> you know, I hadn't expected my future spouse to immediately comment on the attractiveness of another woman, but we were just getting to know each other. I, I mean, maybe this was her coy sense of humor. I went ahead and ordered a shrimp pasta dish, which much to my horror arrived with all the shrimp still in their shells. Clumsily, I worked to remove each shrimp from its exoskeleton, prompting Emily to look at me with abject horror. Your table manners are absolute rubbish, she said with great disdain. Strangely, Emily's coldness only made me want her more. All I can say is that this is a time when Simon Cowell was all the rage. There was something very hot about being degraded by an angry Brit. So I tried to remain optimistic as Emily and I boarded the ferry to Santorini. And when we arrived, she walked me to the lodging that she'd booked for us, this beautiful villa with a rooftop that afforded panoramic views of the island. I started imagining making out before a Grecian sunset. And she turned to the proprietor of the establishment, looked at him sternly and barked, can you make sure we get a room with two separate beds? <laughs> As I lay awake that night in my individual twin bed, I had to wonder what had gone wrong. 
Like, surely she would not have invited me on this trip unless she, too, was looking forward to some Santorini snogging. <laughs> the next day, Emily and I had lunch at what has to be the most romantic restaurant on the planet. Perched on a cliff high above the Aegean Sea, I was so overtaken with the beauty of the moment that I would have made out with my cousin. <laughs> it was at this moment that Emily looked at me and said, Tori, I'd like to make a video of you as you eat your food, and then we can watch it back together and talk about your table manners. <laughs> and that is exactly what we did. We, <laughs> we watched it many times over, and then she gave me instructions on how to hold a fork and knife like a civilized person. But then guys, then things took a turn. Then we really started to fall in love. Actually, no, I'm totally kidding. <laughs> The rest of our date was horrible. All 11 excruciating days of it. <laughs> we would go on hikes and she would just walk away. She offered to pay for many of my meals, but then she criticized the way I ate at every single one. In the decades since going on this trip together, we have literally never spoken again. Though she did randomly weigh in on a Facebook post last year concerning whether or not I look like Hannah Gadsby. <laughs> In the end, I never got to have my intercontinental love affair, but I am very much available for domestic love affairs if anybody wants to see me after the show. <laughs> after ample instruction and practice, I can promise you I have impeccable table manners. Thank you. Thank you.